Who here recognizes that fellow? Yes, that is Jed Clampett of the Beverly Hillbillies. And, and what is he doing? He, he's hunting for some food. And do you remember what happens when he pulls the trigger? The bullet goes into the ground and out comes a bumbling, bubbling crude. Times have changed uh, since then. You've got to do a lot more than poke some holes in your backyard to find the oil. And the oil industry has done just that. They've been able to push the frontier of discovery quite a ways since uh, the time that Jed and the hillbillies were on TV. They've actually pushed it quite a ways since JR uh, was on TV. The ability of the industry to find and retrieve oil is now nothing short of remarkable. Two particular areas of tremendous progress that have allowed this to happen have been in seismic technology, where we've gone from uh, 2D, past 3D, into 4D imagery, and uh, drilling rig technology, uh, which has evolved from wooden piers that were attached to land to the beaches, and this is a picture from the 1890s, uh, to these amazing machines like this picture of the Deepwater Horizon that have been featured on the History Channel's Modern Marvels. If I had, or if I could pick one phrase that uh, captures the implications of these developments for offshore drilling, and probably a phrase that would have made a pretty good uh, subtitle for tonight's presentation, it would be deeper and deeper. Okay, um, this is a picture of a rig named uh, Kermac. The picture's from 1947, uh, and this was the year that Kermac became the first freestanding offshore rig that was out of view of land. And I'm going to use this, this, this picture or this date as a point of departure for a little bit of a, a, a it's a video animation. Uh, and what I'm just trying to do is give you an idea of the progression offshore of the industry starting the year after um, Kermak was there. It moves through the 1950s, which there was some pretty rapid development. Um, you had uh, submersible barges and jack-up rigs through the 60s. Uh, 60s, the development slowed down a little bit, even though technology development was advancing. That's because, uh, if anybody here recalls, uh, oil prices collapsed down to the 2 to $3 range per barrel down there. 70s, things picked up again, both in terms of the development uh, as well as uh, the uh, offshore development and technology. And I stopped it here in 1979, and it's kind of hard to see, but I have a little orange dot uh, up there. Um, which is, uh, represents a, a, a rig, I'm sorry for the blurriness, we'll have it fixed next time, it, but a rig called uh, Cognac. Now, what, what, Cognac's claim to fame, it was the first oil rig to produce in more than a thousand foot of water. It was built in 1978. It was actually this huge traditional jacket structure that they had to build in three pieces and then assemble it on site. In 1979, it came online and it started producing just in time for the Iranian oil revolution uh, and the, the spike in, in gas prices. And in 1980, actually, Shell, uh, who had this uh, rig built, won uh, an outstanding civil engineering achievement award, which was the first for uh, an oil company. And then the one other um, reason that I, I picked 1979 to stop was in, in 1980. That was the year that JR was shot. So um, I, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't being silly. I was actually being serious, again, when I underscore the point that uh, we've come a long way since 1980. So I'm going to fast forward it through the rest of this period. And you can see now color coded um, orange, yellow, and red. These are now deeper wells, the red being what's called ultra deep or over uh, 5,000 feet. OK, so we get rapid development to the end of the, of the graph. I've got this one up here, and it actually, I think, does an even better job of showing you how important deep water development has come. This is a graph of um, our oil production in the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see, even at the time of Cognac, which is a, a few years before here, throughout the 1980s, it was less than 10%. A relatively small portion of our oil from the Gulf came from deep water development. In part, the 1980s, uh, gas prices came way down again. Uh, I'm sorry, um, oil prices down into the, the $10 to $15 range. And so so it was, it was prohibitively expensive to, to develop these wells. 
Uh, but once we get to the, the, the late 1990s, mid to late 1990s, things take off to the point where now it's actually more than 80% of our oil from the Gulf of Mexico comes from wells that are over 1,000 feet. That black region re represents the ultra deep wells, the ones that are over 5,000 feet. Okay, I, I'm. I'm I'm going to use this graph to underscore a really important point. A little bit earlier, I gave you sort of the catchphrase for the night, which was deeper and deeper. And when I used that term, I wasn't trying to be redundant. I actually meant deeper in two different ways. What has happened, particularly since the 1990s, is that the industry is not only drilling in, in deeper water, but it's actually drilling into much deeper or older geology. Now, up until the mid-1990s, there was a lot of uncertainty within the industry about how productive this older geology would be especially the geology that were under, underneath salt layers, which is represented here by it. We've got it in white. Um, reason being, it was very hard up until the mid-1990s for, for the seismic technology to penetrate through uh, those salt layers. Now, the salt layers and salt domes have always been very attractive targets, and the Gulf of Mexico is, is dimpled with them in the center and western Gulf, not really around Florida, but over in the center and western Gulf. But up until the mid to late 1990s, what the industry did is they target reservoirs that were along the sides of the salt domes or on top of the salt domes. They didn't really go below. The company that really pushed the envelope um, on this stuff was actually BP. Shell was the leader in the Gulf up till, again, 1990, early 1990s. BP really took off from there. And what they found um, was that they are, they're vast reservoirs uh, underneath the salt domes in the older geology with prolific flow rates, tremendous potential. I mean, we're talking about Saudi Arabia like uh, a potential, but with great potential also comes great risk. Okay, let's come back now to the Deepwater Horizon. Deepwater Horizon was a, a state-of-the-art, semi-submersible, dynamically positioned by satellite uh, drilling rig uh, owned by Transocean, the largest offshore drilling company in the world. Deepwater Horizon was built in 2001 for $350 million, and Transocean rents Deepwater Horizon to the big oil companies to the, at about a half a million dollars a day. Now, what the oil companies use Deepwater Horizon for is to, act, to drill the wells. Deepwater Horizon is too expensive to use to, to, to actually use, use it to produce the oil or get it up. They come out, they, they, they drill in really challenging environments, they find the oil, sometimes they set up the production well, but then they go to the next job. What the companies will do will bring in less expensive rigs um, to actually pump the oil. Now, in, in September of 2009, the Deepwater Horizon made an amazing discovery in a field called Tiber. This is 2009, September, so we're talking just a little bit less than two years ago. Um, what they found, and this was on behalf of British Petroleum, uh, was a massive oil field uh, in 4,000 foot of water, but the well, the well that was drilled was actually 35,000 feet. Uh, Deepwater Horizon set a record uh, with that well. 35,000 feet um, uh, below the, the drilling surface. It was estimated, it's estimated right now to be somewhere between four and six billion barrels of oil. That's one of the largest discoveries in the history of the Gulf of Mexico, in the country no less. And just to give you an idea, um, anything over 250 million barrels of oil in a reserve is considered a huge field. So Tiber is considered like 20 huge fields all wrapped into to one. As soon as uh, Deepwater Horizon was finished, BP sent it to its next job, and its next job uh, was to finish up drilling a well at um, a prospect called Macondo. And the Macondo well is in the Mississippi Canyon here. Uh, it's zeroing in. It's a very productive area. Uh, we zero in here about 40 miles southeast of the little peninsula there uh, in Louisiana. Now, uh, the Macondo field or the Macondo prospect was in something known as Block 252. It was about a nine square mile lease. BP paid $34 million for it. Um, and the Deepwater Horizon was uh, out there finishing up, uh, finishing up its job. Now, one of the things that I think is particularly important is uh, the Deepwater Horizon, actually, let me just go back for a second. One of the rumors uh, that was rolling around in the early months or the early days or the early weeks. I actually heard it even when I got to New Zealand. The rumors was that uh, BP had drilled beyond its lease um, in, in the oil well. And that was actually false. They didn't drill beyond their, their lease because the day, that they were, the day before this picture was taken, the 12th, on the 11th of April, um, there was an incident. And the incident was known as a, um, 
a lost circulation event. And, and what happens in a lost circulation event, it's like a rupture somewhere at the bottom of the well. And it's pretty serious if you don't deal with it uh, quickly. And it reflects a really, I mean, a, 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 one of the most challenging as aspects of the drilling is if you don't put enough pressure down the, the, the well bore and the well hole, you, you get oil and gas reservoirs, which would be down here. It can break in and push up, and you can get a blowout like the one that actually happened. So your first thought would be making sure you're putting enough pressure down there. But if you don't, if you put too much pressure on the well, you can actually rupture it uh, near the bottom. The rupture, you could have the oil and gas, then um, the hydrocarbons can, can leak into the surrounding geologic structure. It can make the well unproductive. And in some really bad case scenarios, like Santa Barbara actually, if it's close enough to the surface, you can get a blowout where the oil and gas is coming into the water, not from the, the wellhead, but actually it's, cre it's creeping up through other areas in the geology. So that's what's actually happened in the Santa Barbara spill. It was a blowout, but it didn't come through the wellhead. It actually came because of a rupture in the, in the actual well. So back to Deepwater Horizon on the 12th, they had a lost circulation event. They rupture, there's a rupture um, on the bottom of the well, and the, and the, uh, the Transocean crew, the, the crew dealt with it very quickly. They put something called a lost circulation pill, which is like a viscous fluid, kind of like an epoxy, and they pump it down the well, and it ultimately uh, repaired the leak, and then they continued on uh, with their work. And the reason that I point that out is because the concern about doing that again, rupturing the well again, shaped the rest of the decisions that um, that they were to make. Now, right around that time, they were, they were getting close to finishing, um, but Deepwater Horizon, this project at Macondo, was nearly six weeks uh, over, uh, and it was, there were nearly $60 million uh, over budget and about six weeks behind schedule. And these delays not only hurt at the Macondo project, but they have ripple effects, because the Deepwater Horizon can't start on its next project until it fi finishes this one. So they were rushing. They were rushing to get out of there, uh, and on the uh, the 18th of April, they were less than 48 hours away uh, from being done uh, and moving on. And they still had, though, one of the most critical uh, tasks to perform, and that is the cement job. Enter Halliburton. Halliburton does uh, cement. Cement jobs are uh, easier said than done. Now, your, your first thought, what do you do, pour cement down a well? What do you, what, what do you want to do that for? Uh, the cement job is actually really important. It does a few different things. One of the things that it does is you have drilling pipe, or it's called casing, um, in your well bore. Well bore is the actual well hole. So the, the casing is actually inside of it, and the cement locks that or holds that drilling, that casing in place. It also fills the, a space called the annulus, which is between the casing um, and the actual well bore, and it seals off the, the reservoir so the hydrocarbons can't escape. Now, in order, this kind of sounds kind of technical, but we tried to put together a little animation that hopefully you might be able to visualize it a little bit better, and let's see how it works. So, okay, you have the, ca this is the casing coming down from a drilling rig, and that's the, pi you know, that's pipe. It's hollow in the middle, and so the, drill the drills will go down that. It'll come through the well head, and they'll put it down uh, the well bore all the way to the bottom. And once they get it into place, they start pumping a big slug of cement. And the cement will then turn the corner and start coming back up uh, the sides. Uh, and that's the analyst, that little part uh, there, the space between. And then, uh, voila, you've secured your, your well. You're, you're set to go. Um, you might wonder, you know, how do you get back at the, you know, the, the oil after you've sealed it off with cement? Well, they just come back and punch a hole through it and start pumping with the, with the next rig when they're ready to go. One of those critical, uh, though, and challenging and tricky parts of the cement process is that the actual cement mix. You think there might be sort of, sort of standard off-the-shelf cement mix? No. Um, given the fact that these, these, the temperatures and the pressures at the bottom of the well vary, every well is different, every well has its own personality, and what they have to do is they have to calibrate the cement mix to the particular conditions that they anticipate finding and then ultimately find um, at the well. Now, Halliburton was requested by BP to use what was considered a cutting-edge technology, it was nitrogen foam. Um, and the nitrogen foam, what it is, is it's a cement mix that's got nitrogen bubbles in it. And the reason for that is that the, the bubbles then uh, lower the density of the cement mix. And if you have lower density, it weighs less, but supposedly it's just as strong. And that actually puts less pressure down there. And so it, it's, it's safer in terms of not getting the ruptures. And that's what they were worried about. So ask them to do the, the, the uh, nitrogen foam mix. And 
One of the big storylines that I, I take it you probably have heard, if not you'll hear it right now, uh, Halliburton conducted its own lab uh, reports and they had three tests, one in February, one in March, and one in April, all showing that it would be unstable given the conditions that were down there. And they never told or they never alerted BP to this fact. Now there's a, there was a fourth test potentially that Halliburton claims it did right as they were doing the cement job, but this is in dispute right now and it's going to end up in the court system. All right, this is a little bit technical, but I just want to show you what happened. Uh, when they did the cement job, the cement job did not go as smoothly as one, like, would, one would like. They have these little parts here that are called float collars and they just channel the stuff in the right place. They had a problem setting the float collars. It took them a little while, they were a little stubborn, but eventually the float collars set and it looked as if there were no glaring red flags, the cement job went okay. Inexplicably, however, after they got done, they sent the Halliburton technicians home without doing a set of very useful but optional uh, tests on the cement job. They're called cement logs, and what they do is they use acoustic equipment and they pump it, you know, uh, they send it down there and, and it will show them if there's something wrong with the cement job. Those tests were never done, saved BP about $25,000, $50,000, and it also saved them a few more hours. And like I said, they were in a rush to get out of there. What ended up happening, and this is from the, the, the final report from the presidential investigation, um, is that the cement didn't set right and apparently uh, the, the oil and gas penetrated through the bottom part of it called the shoe track and then up and into the the analysts and so it, the cement didn't set right and you had a, you had a uh, uh, a blowout in process right from uh, the beginning. Now, when, when, the, when the gas seeps into the oil well through a failed cement job, it doesn't just shoot to the surface. It's under so much pressure down at the bottom of the well that it creeps very, very slowly over time. It's going to take a couple of hours before, boom, you get a freight train near the top. So the clock was ticking after the failed cement job. The clock was ticking in more ways than one as BP was, again, really rushing to get out of there. And what they ended up doing is they're, 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 the series of the procedures that they had to, put, had to do before they leave, they're called the abandonment sequence, they changed them up a number of times in the last 48 hours in a rush to get out of there. Um, they consolidated a number of different steps and they actually reduced some of their safety margins and some of they were doing beyond what was um, allowed. And so some of the, the violations in the, in the reports came to the sequence of things that they were doing in, in a rush to get out of there. One would think uh, uh, that you know, there would be some signs of a blowout in process, and, and there were. Um, one of the biggest ones, one of the last things, a few hours before they actually pull something called a blowout preventer off, which I'll talk about in a second, um, they did these things called uh, pressure tests. There's a positive and a negative uh, pressure tests. Uh, and what they do is they test for the integrity. It's another way of getting at looking at the cement job. Positive tests went fine. Negative pressure tests showed um, that when they reduced the pressure to zero in a well, it kept coming back up. That's a sign that there's, there's a potential a breach in the cement job um, and there's a problem. There was a bit of an anomaly with that test because they were testing two different pipes. The main one showed a high pressure. The other one didn't. They got their heads together and some guy from Transocean um, said that he's seen this before. It's something called a bladder effect or a false echo. Don't worry about it. And so they didn't. They continued on uh, with the rest of the project. Now, for the, the, you know, the next hour or two, what ended up happening is their instruments were showing that there was a problem or blowout in place. There should have been signs in terms of some of the mud levels were not uh, right. But the, the, the Transocean crew, they were obviously multitasking and probably distracted and they missed uh, the signs and the signals. We don't know for sure because the ones that missed it, they were all killed in the accident. Um, boom. So what ends up happening is the Transocean crew does not react until suddenly mud and spacer and fluids are starting to spew back out of the, the, the riser. What the riser is, is this little piece of equipment here from the wellhead up to the, up to the, up to the top there. Once it starts spitting out on the rig, you, it's kind of too late because it, uh, there's a freight train of gas that's now coming up, uh, up, the, up the riser uh, and it, once it spews out, it quickly ignites and you get a series of explosions. Now, perhaps, no, not perhaps, the most important piece of equipment in the entire uh, drilling process, something called a blowout preventer or a BOP, and this is a picture of it after it was retrieved uh, from the well. Now, a blowout preventer performs a number of functions on a, a rig. Perhaps the most important one is it's your last line of defense uh, in an emergency. Now, there's, it's a very complicated apparatus. It weighs 450 tons. It's like $15 million just for that one little piece of equipment uh, right there. Uh, it was sitting on the, the top of the well, 
and there's two ways of activating it. There's a, like an emergency switch. There's a few of them on the rig, and you just press it, um, and it can activate something called shear rams. There's lots of things to close off the different pipes, but the shear rams just shear the pipes right off, seal the well completely. If, in fact, you don't press the button and the, and the blowout preventer loses contact with the rig, it's supposed to automatically activate its shear rams. There's other ways of doing it. In Brazil and Norway, they have uh, acoustic switches. Uh, that you can activate remotely. We didn't think they were necessary here. Um, robotic vehicles is what they tried to use a little bit uh, later. It didn't uh, work. And let me just show you what, what happened. We learned after they were able to retrieve the blowout preventer. Um, the force of the explosion on the, the way up exerted so much pressure that it bowed the drill pipe. It bowed the drill pipe. So if you look down at that blue, that blue, that's the shear ram there. And so when they went to, to close the shear ram, the pipe's supposed to be right in the middle, and it's supposed to get a nice cut and it seal it, and it didn't. And what it ended up happening was it, it, it kind of clipped the side of it, and um, the oil and gas were spewing. And it not only it didn't shut it down, but it actually made it much more difficult in some of the things they were trying to do afterwards to get the well um, shut off. Now, um, before I leave the blowout preventer, I just want to make one other point that prior to them finding out that this is what actually happened, there was a lot of speculation and a lot of focus that was put on the blowout preventers. And it was, we learned that they, the reliability record of these things was not what we, what we thought. In particular, there are some very critical components that if they were to lose hydraulic fluid, um, the whole thing could not work. And there's something very simple. You got to change the batteries. Um, <laughs> And apparently, if you don't, um, the whole thing might not work in an emergency. And the, the maintenance records of uh, BP Transocean were a little bit spotty. Now, this is not exactly what caused this one, but there was a revelation for the industry in that blowout preventers are not as reliable as, as we thought. So let me just take a moment here and get back to the... So what happened? Just to review what happened, um, the cement job failed, and that's on Halliburton. Although BP bears some responsibility with that for sending the Halliburton guys home and not actually performing some tests that it could have showed them that there was a problem. Well abandonment procedures were rushed. That's on BP, clearly on BP. They're not only rushed, they broke some rules, they violated uh, uh, some codes, did a number of things, and we don't really have time to get into the details, but this was very, very important. It shaped a lot of what happened. Uh, the Transocean crew just did not see the kick. They didn't see that the, the explosion was in process. It was happening, and they missed it. Uh, that's on them, and then the blowout preventer failed. Cameron's the company that, that built it, so they bear some responsibility. But BP and Transocean, they bear a little responsibility for that, too, because their maintenance record was a little bit, a little bit spotty. Um, all right, let me get to the why. So uh, more in particular, what can be said about uh, the regulatory or a regulatory regime that allowed this to happen? Um, the general point is we have a, we're had a, a weaker regulatory regime um, than we thought, and let me, I want to focus just on three different shortcomings that I see. The first, regulatory capture, second, regulatory capacity, and third, regulatory approach. With regulatory capture, it's an academic term, and what it refers to is that a, a particular, a regulatory agency is in, in essence captured by the industry that it's supposed to be uh, regulating. Um, the Minerals Management Service was initiated, it was started in 1982 under the Reagan administration under Interior Secretary James Watt. It has a very interesting uh, history and I, I don't want to keep everybody here for the next uh, three hours so I'm not going to get into the history. Um, I think it's safe to say, or I think it's fair to characterize the Minerals Management Service over most of its history as a captured agency. But I think all of you know that and so I'm not going to belabor that point. Um, Let's just assume for a second, though, that they weren't captured and that the people that were working at the MMS uh, were trying to do their jobs to the best of their ability, which and I think is, a, is actually a fair and accurate uh, characterization of, of many, or if not most, of the employees that were, were working there. But let me draw your attention. I'm going to put back up that, um, uh, that production volume chart that we had up earlier, and I want to look at the minerals management budget. And if you look, go back to 1984, and this is under uh, Reagan and Watt, uh, this is adjusted to $2,005. Uh, we have a $250 million uh, budget. And then the budget line goes down under $200 million, and it stays south of $200 million for the remainder of the period. So when we have this, this tremendous explosion um, of offshore development, which was, it's not simply a, a matter of degree, but in-kind changes to where we're getting our oil and all the technical challenges that are associated with it, there is no commensurate increase in the, in, the, in the budget, in the staff of MMS to actually regulate that. 
Um, one other interesting chart that I'll throw up there. This is the number of inspections in the Gulf of Mexico from 1990 to 2009. As you can see, again, they don't go up either, but one of the most interesting things on this chart is that, that lightly shaded blue area at the bottom, can you see that blue area? That's the unannounced inspections. The up stuff on the top are the ones that they know are coming ahead of time. Unannounced inspections go from uh, maybe close to half of inspections were unannounced uh, back in 1990. By the late 1990s, it drops virtually to zero. So you're not getting any unannounced inspections. Um, one other point to make about regulatory capacity uh, is simply just a, a, a note up about expertise. And this is not to disparage the folks that are working at a Minerals Management Service, but if you were a, a, a petroleum engineer or a petroleum geologist um, working, they were at the cutting edge of the developments that were happening at the time, you're going to get paid three, four, five more times for your services if you're working for industry than you are if you're working for the, uh, the MMS. And so just a point of fact, it was hard, and this was in the reports as well. A lot of the MMS employees that were being asked to provide exemptions for saying they didn't quite understand the implications of what were happening. So there's an expertise issue here that underscores the point about capacity. Finally, let me just make a point um, about uh, the regulatory approach. And without getting into wonkies, I'm going to make this as simple as possible. Um, in, in the risk management literature and in the industry, there's debates about a prescriptive versus a safety case approach. A prescriptive approach, picture a gigantic manual written by the government, which is one size fits all, regulations for everything that you're going to do. Um, safety case approach, you might think of it as a series of booklets written by industry and approved by government for each and every well uh, that they drill. On the prescriptive approach side, anything that's changing in terms of the challenges and what's going on in the industry, it's the government's responsibility to update the regulations and the mandates. On the safety case approach side, it's the industry's responsibility to continuously tell the government what's going on that's different and what they're going to do in order to manage their risks uh, effectively. That's an oversimplification. It's not either or. They're not mutually exclusive. But it's an important point that was made in the reports. In 1980, uh, the Alexander Keeland, a Norwegian rig, it sunk off the coast of uh, Norway in the North Sea. Uh, 123 people were killed. Not long after that, Norway went to a safety case approach. In 1982, Ocean Rangers sank off the coast of Newfoundland. 84 people were killed. Not long after that, Canada went to the safety case approach. In 1988, Piper Alpha exploded off the coast, again, in the North Sea, but it was um, a British rig, uh, killing 167 people. Not long after that, the UK went to a safety case approach. Guess what the United States did? There was debate for the next 20 years about whether or not we should be following in the footsteps of these other countries. Our industry, I think because of cost factors and, and, and a desire from dis some discretion, uh, resisted that. And so we've had some voluntary elements, um, but they're not mandatory. Uh, and we, for the next 20 years, uh, did not uh, adopt a safety case approach until um, our own accident. So, and we're moving in that direction now. So let's get back to the, the next day. This is the 21st of April. Um, the fire rages out of control. By late in the day, it collapses. The smoke can actually be seen. Um, from satellite pictures. Now, early reports um, confirm that the 11 workers uh, that were missing are, are, are presumed uh, dead, but the good news in the first few days was uh, that we were told that it did not appear that the well was leaking, and so it wouldn't turn into an environmental catastrophe. Uh, but that was soon uh, found to be wrong and updated a few days later. Uh, and we were told that the well appears to be leaking at an estimated 1,000 barrels a day. Uh, after uh, a week or so, uh, satellite imagery um, provoked a number of independent scientists to, to question that very vigorously. There was simply too much oil coming to the surface for there to be uh, 1,000 barrels a day. So they updated it, uh, the estimate, to 5,000 barrels uh, a day was probably leaking. 
And then they, they put together three different teams of experts that had their own methodologies that they would look at, and the government then reported um, that, in fact, it looked as if it was between 12 and 19,000 barrels a day. In the fine print of that report, and clarified not for like a week or two after that, was that was the lower bound that the three teams came up with. The upper bound, they couldn't agree on. It could be up to 100,000 barrels, but they reported between 12 and 19. Ultimately, we, we learned it was somewhere in the 60s. Over 60,000 barrels a day were leaking, and that receded somewhat towards uh, the end of the, the crisis as the well, not much, maybe somewhere into the 50s as, they, uh, as the well began to lose pressure. And so uh, we uh, attacked it with dispersants through the air. We skimmed and burned at the surface. We put out boom, lots of boom around sensitive coastal areas. Now, the boom wars were an interesting uh, thread. A lot of frustration on the part of uh, local and state government officials. And you have this unfolding slow train wreck, that's and there's nothing that they can do. The only thing symbolically, maybe, that you think that you could get a lot of boom out there. So there was lots of fights about how much boom you'd have, even though it wasn't very effective, and who had, you know, who had more boom than, than, than you know, the next governor. And, and Bobby Jindal, obviously, um, Louisiana was in the bullseye on this, but Bobby Jindal fought pretty darn hard to get as much boom as he could. Um, and he also fought, if you would recall, for the government to build, he demanded that the government and Army Corps of Engineers build him a sand berm. A sand berm that actually everybody knew was not going to get finished until well after this whole thing um, was over. Um, so uh, he put enough pressure on the, uh, the president that he turned around and told the Army Corps of Engineers to go build the guy his uh, sand berm. So it did get built and it didn't really do much, um, but it spent money and there's some ecological implications of that as well. The uh, president made a number of trips down uh, to Louisiana, again, trying to fight off the perception that this was his Hurricane Katrina. Uh, meanwhile, back in D.C., the executives of BP, Transocean, and Halliburton uh, were hauled before Congress and scolded for allowing this to happen by most of Congress, with the exception of Joe Barton, who actually apologized to BP uh, for what he perceived as a shakedown uh, when the government agreed, uh, the BP agreed to, to provide $20 billion in, uh, in, a, in a claims facility. Now, uh, they were also told to try to hurry up and plug that leak fast, and so they came up with uh, uh, attempts that were known as a, a, a top hat and a kill shot, and they didn't work, and then the media made fun of that. Uh, also, right around that time, uh, BP was ordered to provide its footage of its uh, video cameras to the public, and so we were introduced to SpillCam, uh, which was available on the web 24 hours a day. By late May, about a, a month after this was over, the spill sheen became a, uh, a, a easily discernible feature of the entire northern uh, Gulf. The oil got into the marshes and the wetland areas. And it got on the beach, and uh, it affected the wildlife. Although some of the wildlife we were able to d clean off and, uh, and rescue. Now, while I'm on the topic of, of wildlife, I cannot res I mean, I have to come to, oh, the one point before I come to that is, uh, with respect to the fisheries, um, we're not quite sure the full extent of the impact uh, of the spill on the seafood, but one of the things we are sure about, nobody wanted to buy it. Uh, uh, for, for quite some time. So, but on the issue of wildlife, let me come to um, BP's uh, wildlife plan, which is as part of a component of its, uh, its emergency response plan. Listed as the wildlife expert to call in a case of emergency uh, was none other than Dr. Peter uh, Lutz. Now, Dr. Peter Lutz uh, was a renowned sea turtle expert with impeccable credentials. And so I think, in principle, he is the type of guy you want to call in a wildlife emergency associated with, an, with uh, an oil spill. The only problem is that Dr. Lutz, unfortunately, passed away five years before BP submitted its plan. Again, five years before they submitted a plan, this guy had passed away. When they looked closer at the wildlife response plan, they saw that listed under species of concern were the walrus and the seal. And now, I like walruses and seals, and I welcome BP's concern for them. But given that the well in question was in the Gulf of Mexico, 
the oil spill would have to travel a very, very, very long way before it became a problem uh, for walruses and shields. Now, if it wasn't bad enough uh, that the BP plan was pathetic, um, when they pulled the files for other wells in the Gulf and looked at the plans of Shell and ExxonMobil and Chevron and ConocoPhillips, guess what? They all look remarkably similar. It's as if there's one consultant out there working for all the industries, cutting and pasting stuff from Alaska and submitting it on when they're filing their reports. And I'm not sure who I'm more angry at, that consultant or the bureaucrat that was approving all of these things. All right, I'll cut to the chase. Let me just, again, try to sum up my thoughts on the contingency plan that existed for an uncontrolled blowout in 5,000 feet of water. There wasn't any. There was no contingency plan for this type of event, even though we learned in the investigations that were to follow, it was far from an unforeseeable event. And I think that that's simply inexcusable. Let me talk just a little bit about some of the environmental uh, consequences. Um, I think uh, that the amount of oil uh, that was spilled was approximately an estimated 5 uh, million barrels, which is about uh, 200 million gallons of oil. I was trying to get a sense of, I wonder, that's a, a big number, but sometimes we put numbers out there without any reference point. So trying to think of what can I do to convey this idea. How much, I thought about oh, an oil tank or truck. How about, let's go find a big oil tank truck and let's just see how many oil tank trucks that fills up. Guess how many? More than 3,000, more than 4,000, more than five, six. More than 10,000 oil tank trucks. More than 15,000. More than 18, 19. It's actually more than 20,000 oil tank trucks. So where did all the oil go? This is a very good question. The government put out this oil budget, uh, which again tries to uh, estimate, and I stress estimate, what happened uh, to the oil that was released at the wellhead. Now with the exception of some of the stuff at the top, none of this is, is actually measured amounts. It's more back of the envelope calculations. Um, and there's just a lot of uncertainty in terms, uh, especially with the residuals, which residuals just mean they don't know. Um, and there's evaporated and dissolved and, and naturally uh, dispersed. One of the reasons that there's such a great amount of uncertainty about where the oil, oil, all the oil went, um, and I just have a picture of EPA Administrator Lisa Jackson. She had a huge faux pas where she actually got in front of the TV and said, well, 75% of it's gone. Um, and again, this just, just underscored not necessarily willful conspiracy or manipulation, but they're just incompetent sometimes in terms of communicating what was happening, both flow rates as well as the fate of the oil uh, uh, to the public. So let me come back. reason that there was so much uncertainty um, was the unprecedented use of two million, ga two million gallons of, of a dispersant called core exit. Much of it was actually um, used at the wellhead, just sprayed directly into the oil as it was being released. Now, uh, this certainly got a lot of attention, uh, a lot of attention here in Florida, a lot of angst and concern over the use of uh, dispersants. There was, uh, there was a lot of talk, too, of conspiracy, and that, again, the reason that they were doing this was to keep the oil off the surface and out of view of the, of the public. I, I don't quite buy that. I think that that might have been a fortuitous benefit for, uh, for BP, but it's pretty plain and simple. There was a calculation or a risk trade-off that um, the, the government had to make. It, what do you want to protect more? Do you want to protect the beaches and the coastal marshes, or do you want to protect the water column and the sea bottom? Because you, you can't do both. You've got to, again, pick one or the other. And um, Coast Guard pushed very hard, and EPA signed off on the use of dispersants, and, and the reason being, uh, again, they just accepted a greater risk um, of what would happen in the water column and on the sea bottom. Now, as part of the commission, BP oil spill commission that was set up by the president, um, they took a look. They had a, an, a, an appendix or a side uh, paper that looked specifically at the dispersant issue, and they asked themselves uh, three questions, or they considered three questions. The first was, did we know enough to make this decision about the dispersants? 
Second question was, given what we knew at the time, was this a reasonable decision to make? And the third was, are we going to come to regret this later? Answer to the first question was no. They simply, the, the amount of science on what dispersants would do at, at that depth and the type of dispersants, just nothing there. So they were, in a way, were flying blind. Given the information that they had and the research that they had, was it a reasonable decision? They answered yes to that question. Um, are they going to come back to bite them? Are they going to come to regret it? Very possibly. Again, it's just a lot that's unknown. Um, now, I think you're probably going to have a, a lot more questions on the environmental uh, impacts. and. Um, I'll just save that for the Q&A uh, session. Um, the answer to a lot of them are going to be the same. It's, time is going to tell. So where do we go uh, from here? Uh, and I think what I'd like to do is just start um, by trying to draw some attention uh, to the BP Oil Spill Commission report, which I thought really contained a, a lot of good ideas. One of the, this was uh, chaired by uh, our former Senator and Governor Bob Graham, and then former Secretary William uh, Riley did a lot of good work. Press sort of picked up on that report the day it came out, and everybody forgot it. They read the executive summary and didn't look at a lot of the other stuff that was in there, which I found uh, to be quite uh, interesting. Now, within their recommendations, there was a whole slew of them. Um, some of them have, have actually been adopted or reforms have been made that address some of the weaknesses or shortcomings that I had said before. MMS has been restructured and reorganized into something called BOMER, which is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and Regulatory Enforcement. And what they did is they sort of separated a number of functions, including uh, regulatory and safety, environment and safety um, regulation enforcement, and tried to give them more autonomy and protection from regulatory capture. Um, Budget. The budget for BOMER appears to be going up in the F, uh, fiscal year 2012. Uh, budget, the budget request from the president is a 50% increase of what they had um, in 2012. Now, these budgets are still subject to the budget wars that are going on in Washington right now, but it, it does appear that um, uh, some folks have uh, realized uh, that to be whining about uh, the, the pace of permit uh, approvals while at the same time uh, gutting the manpower and resources of the permit approvers might not be the most productive uh, thing uh, to do. And finally, on that, uh, the point about the regulatory uh, approach, we are moving. Again, I kind of over-dramatized that prescriptive versus the safety case approach. We are moving, I think, now more rapidly towards uh, adopting safety case uh, emphasis. We've had a number of voluntary uh, codes of conduct and guidelines that um, the American Petroleum Institute is, is put out, but they've been voluntary, and, and over time, up to the spill, they were not being adopted. Actually, you had less numbers, uh, less firms that were adopting them. They're now going to be made mandatory. Uh, BOMER is in the process of strengthening them. And I think uh, when it comes to um, capture, capacity, and approach, we're pointed in the right direction uh, and taking some, some baby steps. One of the things that I think was really missed by the media and the press uh, and I found the most interesting, though, was, that, was the, the tone and the thrust of a lot of what was in the Deepwater Horizon recommendations, which the way that I had read them is I thought there was a lot in there that was not meant to constrain uh, the industry with more mandates and higher permitting hurdles, but there was a lot of stuff that was in there that was actually meant to sort of challenge the industry to exercise greater leadership in the area of uh, risk management. And I think that there was some of that stuff that did, in fact, appeal to me. If you get a, I mean, you realize the complexity and the number of decisions that have to be made in, in this deep water drilling. For me, I'm somewhat skeptical that you could have a government bureaucrat that can micromanage that, that process in that industry. So there's some discretion, I think, that the, the industry needs to have in making a lot of these decisions that it's making. But it just needs to do a much better job of putting in place the, the capacity in adopting some of the best practice tools that are out there that are being used in other countries, but not here uh, in our own. And I think beyond simply putting in place the capacity, there need to be changes in terms of the, the culture within the industry. They have to demonstrate that they take this stuff seriously, that they're proactive, that they anticipate how things are changing, to just stay one step ahead of the curve. And when you look again at that wildlife plan and other elements of what they did, especially, again, you know, what to do, there was just no contingency plan for containing the oil. They're just not there uh, yet. And so there was a challenge. Um, uh, but I'm, I don't think that it uh, was res responded to all that well. And a lot of the work that I've done on drilling writ large, including reading a lot of the, the investigative reports of uh, deep water, there are 
four themes that continue to pop up, knowledge, transparency, capacity, incentives. On knowledge, there's just a lot of stuff that we should know sometimes that we don't, um, including a lot of the environmental issues uh, within the Gulf, what to do, uh, there's no contingency plan. Sometimes we do know stuff, but it's not uh, made available information to people that uh, should know or uh, have a right to know, again, like the reliability record of um, the blowout preventers. Capacity issues, we've talked about them, so I won't har belabor the point. Incentives, much of the Deepwater Horizon story is just, in it's a story about incentives to save time and cut corners, um, strong incentives to do that, and the, the sort of the, the penalties for making mistakes or breaking rules um, are, are, are very modest. So, it was my hope, I think, that we would have in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon um, a really good uh, public discussion about how we can uh, do a little bit better. And I've been disappointed, certainly disappointed, over the last uh, six to eight months. Um, what, uh, you know, I think we've seen is, with respect to public opinion around drilling, it's as if Deepwater Horizon never happened. Um, there's just no evidence that it is. Numbers, in terms of with how people feel about the risks uh, and rewards of drilling, are the same exact numbers as you looked at um, uh, prior, to, uh, prior to the Deepwater Horizon uh, accident. And so uh, it doesn't surprise me that the, the industry um, has been uh, very aggressive. It is Christmas whistlets. It's, it's back to expedited permitting, expanded access, and protection of uh, um, favorable uh, tax treatments, and you have a lot of politicians out there uh, right now that really there's no other lesson that they're drawing from Deepwater Horizon than stuff happens. Um, and I think that that, you know, it's not surprising, but it's, it's a shame. Uh, let me close, um, and I want to, you know, I want to channel William Shakespeare in the, in the closing with a question to drill or not to drill, because that's where the questions always <laughs> come. I hate that question. Um, and uh, I think is that the question? Sorry. Um, I hate it. Um, if you press me, I think I will um, admit uh, that I am skeptical of society's willingness to leave lucrative energy resources in the ground anywhere, not just here uh, in this country. And so for me, the more interesting uh, questions are uh, where, uh, when, and how we drill, not uh, if we drill. Um, and on the uh, where point, I do not think the march to deeper and deeper um, is going to, to slow down. I just hope um, that we can get smarter about the way that we, that we proceed. So I'm going to uh, stop there and open it up uh, to discussions. I thank you for coming, but I also want to uh, uh, thank Tom Arthur and Scott McCready of the Collins Center for Public Policy that helped me. So if you like the graphics and some of the jokes, it was them. If you didn't like it, I screwed up the delivery. 